we All go. right. Uh, Welcome everybody. Um, so I'm uh, Sam Burden, assistant professor here in uh, ECE at, at UW. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Rust Hedrick. Um, he's a professor of uh, electrical engineering and computer science at MIT, affiliated with the CSAIL, the computer science and AI lab, um, and has appointments in aeronautics, astronautics, mechanical engineering. Um, he's director for the Center for Robotics in CSAIL. Um, he's also, in addition to being a, you know, world leader in uh, robotics research, um, controls, learning. Um, he's also vice president of uh, robotics research at Toyota Robotics Institute, so also a captain of industry. Um, he's won a bunch of awards, career award, uh, an MIT award for undergraduate teaching, the DARPA Young Faculty Award, um, and he was a, a Microsoft Research uh, new faculty fellow. Um, Russ is just a, a tremendous leader in uh, in my field in, in robotics um, and and these are and and in particular he's done some just tremendously interesting and influential work in recent years that he'll talk to us about um, in uh, thinking through how to control through contact so as robots are grabbing and running and leaping and interacting um, with the world um, and and even though he's uh, um, such a well-known uh, kind of leader in the field. Um, he's also been just tremendously generous with his time with me and with a bunch of other people in the field. He's been a great mentor um, for a bunch of younger people in the field, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and uh, if you're logged in synchronously, um, there's a link that is posted in the chat that lets you access his slides. Um, so that'll let you see videos in kind of native frame rate. And he might do an SQL injection in your browser. No, I'm joking. He might uh, offer some executable code to maybe do some live demos or, uh, or interactive stuff. So I highly recommend uh, grabbing that link while you can. So uh, please, Russ, take, take it away. Thank you, Sam. That was quite a nice introduction. Uh, yeah, so it, it's true. So the, the link at the top, which I just pushed it again to the Zoom, um, it just means you get to watch the videos in full frame rate. And I also have some. WebGL that I'll put in your browser, but uh, nothing uh, adversarial, I promise. Okay, so um, thank you for joining me on this sort of weird day. I hope we can distract each other for an hour or so. Um, and uh, and Sam, uh, I think, has put together a cool uh, you know semester for you uh, with a, a theme of around contact and manipulation and locomotion. Uh, Sam and I have had some fun conversations over the years, um, often very much in agreement, but maybe we like to debate on some of the details. And uh, uh, and so I thought I would try to make contact a focus for today. Um, but also I was thinking about all the cool people you guys have in the department. So I try, I'll try i try to touch a few different ideas of, of some people I know are, are, are thinking about there. And so the, the package is parameterizations for feedback control through contact. Now I said in my um, abstract that um, you know, thinking about Sam here, that, that I started uh, doing all this in locomotion. In fact, a long time ago, I was doing passive dynamic walkers and even reinforcement learning for passive dynamic walkers. This was, you know, 2004, ages ago or whatever. And uh, the, the study of locomotion is a beautiful way to start thinking about contact mechanics. I think um, the stories there are very rich and very um, informative, you know, so we think about impulsive collisions, we think about how you uh, Attain stable limit cycles despite impulse. In fact, we think the, the dissipation in, in the collisions is actually responsible for the stabilization effects. There's all these sort of beautiful things and lessons from hybrid control and, and contact mechanics in walking. Uh, you know, that we've, we've also looked at this in sort of quadrupeds. Uh, one of the things you'll note is that all, all of these systems actually, although they're rich in their contact dynamics, they're relatively limited in their contact geometries. Uh, most of our robots, our walking robots are taking, are using sort of spherical feet, point feet contacts, uh, the ones that work best. Uh, and that is one of the things that I think I want to, I want to harp on a little bit today is that, that although it was a beautiful story, um, I found ultimately that, that locomotion, the view of locomotion, um, the locomotion gives of contact is a little bit too simple. So from, lo from you know, quadrupedal locomotion, uh, started thinking about bigger humanoids walking around and, and thinking about the implications of, of controlling something of this complexity still through contact. A lot of, uh, you know, certainly the walking, but also picking up objects and 
putting brushes on the wall while we cut through it and uh, dealing with the stress of, of making this work on game day. And, uh, and this really had a big influence on the way I thought about the feedback control problem. So first of all, it's a beautiful feedback control problem. So, um, you know, this is a model-based control, but clearly not a uh, detailed, uh, there's no model of Andres jumping on the back of the truck, right? There's, there's a quadratic program solving for a balancing controller at, at a, you know, 300 Hertz or so. And this thing was actually incredibly robust, incredibly stable. Uh, you know, this is, this is the beautiful things that you can do with control theory. Okay, but um, it also got me to realize, you know, there was in, in sort of this um, constant complaint I had about the, the local the way we we're doing control and locomotion, which was that um, it's we're very dependent on state estimation. And actually, I somehow forgot to include the video of our robot falling down in the DARPA challenge, but I'm sure many of you have seen it. Uh, but the you know, one of the things that happened on this robot actually while it was getting out of the car was there was a, a, a glitch where the, the tailbone of the robot got hit the seat uh, in a time we didn't expect, okay? And what happened there was, was uh, the state estimator for the robot com got completely confused. The control system now didn't know which way was up and started doing very bad things. And, and, and things went from this sort of beautiful, robust balancing controller to uh, robot <clears throat> fat face first on the cement, you know, very quickly. So, I had this nagging feeling in, uh, in our work on locomotion that we needed to do something different, break the sort of stranglehold of full state feedback. Um, but it was very hard in locomotion research to, to, to think about the harder problems in state estimation. It was always, it's always so compelling to just maybe buy a more expensive IMU or do a little bit better job on the state estimator. And I really think we needed something different. So I've turned my attention now to manipulation and I, I still love locomotion, and I think hopefully the lessons here come back to, to manipulation. But if you think about manipulation, and I don't just mean picking up boxes and setting them down, I mean in the full glory of manipulation, you know, how the heck do you write a feedback controller to do this, right? What is the state in this system, right? Is it the, uh, some approximation of the infinite dimensional string in the rope? Is it uh, some topological uh, state of the rope, you know, do the contact mechanics, you know, if I just make a simulator, is the state, is that something I can just extract from the state or is it very task dependent? Is it very perception dependent? You know, how, how does the tactile sensing in my fingers work? This is like, you know, instead of just saying, oh, I could maybe, maybe solve the problem with a better IMU, this one just breaks the stack. I don't know how to, how to solve that one. We're trying. I mean, this is actually, this is your first uh, 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 injected WebGL uh, thing in your browser here. So uh, hopefully you'll have seen this. Uh, this is now a 3D visualization that has our a simple example of a, um, of a search we do to try to find with policy optimization to try to find uh, a shoe tying behavior <laughs> for uh, for two, you know, sort of scaled kookas or a ridiculously big shoe, okay. But but you know, we're trying we're trying to solve these really hard problems and just starting to get our head around it. This was um, this was just this is a work in progress, a story I hope to tell soon. But it totally breaks our standard control pipeline. So how do we do rigorous, interesting, you know, uh, control that I could deploy for a problem like that? It turns out, I, I can't help but say, like even simulating contact is way harder in manipulation than it is in locomotion. In, in locomotion, you tend to have like the inertia of the robot and the, you know, there's some stiffness in the ground and you kind of tune it up once and you're good. If you have a robot hand interacting with, first of all, much richer contact geometries and a whole variety of inertial scales and the like, We've had to do a lot of work. Emo, of course, has done a lot of work uh, too. We, we've been changing now to even, um, we're sort of, we're thinking about volumetric forms of contact where, where this was a, a simulation that showed that the entire mesh of the, uh, um, of the finger and the skittle are, are being sort of dynamically computed 
in order to find a surface integral to compute contact forces instead of just trying to approximate it with point forces, which ultimately gets you into lots of trouble. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens that I think, um, you know, manipulation is not as rich in, as locomotion in some cases, but in some ways it's just super good and super rich. So I want to take you down a little bit down the road of thinking about what is the contact, what does control for contact look like in this space for manipulation of tying my shoe, of doing crazy complicated tasks. <laughs> and when I say, you know, feedback control through contact with the robot arm, I just need to be super clear. Like the interesting part is not feedback control of the arm. I, if, we, if we want our arm to move through some position in space, even produce some forces on the world, we, we sort of know how to do that. What's interesting is trying to do feedback control to control the state of the environment in this case, right? So even if it's a little red block in this cartoon or if it's a shoelace, that's the state that I'm trying to design a feedback controller to regulate. And it's very hard because you only get to do that through your contact forces. So <clears throat> before we dig in too much, I, it's reasonable to ask, do we actually need all this feedback control? Um, you know, does it, because a lot of tasks in manipulation actually are very easy. Um, and it's reasonable to say maybe open loop stability is enough if I can just do very good planning um, and, and come up with sort of, you know, open loop robust control, then, then maybe I'm good. And there are examples of that. We've seen a lot of that. You know, people make very intelligent grippers that can pick, that basically pick up almost anything with very little, um, you know, it's basically open loop, right? Uh, this is just one of a, of a whole lineup of, of intelligent grippers. <laughs> Um, but I think there's, you know, it'd be very hard to, for instance, you know, button my shirt uh, with a gripper like this, right? So this is uh, a form of manipulation that's super good, but, and super useful in industry and the like, but I don't think it solves the, uh, you know, you can't go through life sort of with a, a hand like that. It's, they're very good for sort of enveloping grasps. And I think for more dexterous manipulation, we don't know how to do that yet. And I think if you really look, this is just a, a fun video that um, Matt Mason and some of his colleagues did um, a few years ago, just high-speed video uh, of, of someone in you know, the convenience store. And if you watch, if you watch yourself, it's very hard to do it, watch yourself. But if you, do, if you even just watch anybody on high-speed video, there's little signs like right now, right there. So she just sort of missed the, the put down. And there's just a little bit of feedback saying, oh, no, I got to re readjust and push it back down. You know, I think these things happen all over the place. I think, you know, when we're picking things up, the contact interactions are actually very different than what we tend to write for our robots. You know, we, we, we tend to think a lot about staying inside the friction cone. And, you know, I don't think stiction is a big constraint uh, uh, here, right? This is, you know, stick slip all over the place. There's constant interactions, there's the tactile sensing, there's constant adjustments, constant feedback. And I think it's it's really, I have to believe that feedback, if we get it right, is going to open up what we can do in manipulation. By the way, please interrupt, ask questions anytime. You could also question, you know, maybe it's already solved, right? So um, we've seen some awesome examples of people throwing, um, you know, deep reinforcement learning at the problem. And it's it, honestly, for me, I, I think it's a little hard to understand how solved the problem is in, in these kind of examples, but I think it's unquestionably amazing and good that even the level of control that we're seeing in these videos comes out of a pretty simple recipe of, of making the simulator. I mean, that's not an easy step that, you know, that uh, writing the cost function, which I think in this task is okay, but in, you know, buttoning my shirt might still be very hard. But then to just do deep policy gradient and get these results out is something sort of amazing. And I want to think about that with you a little bit. Like, uh, should we expect that to work? You know, wh why does, why or when does gradient-based policy search work? And I don't have the answer, but I, I can, we can push on it in a few directions, right? So um, if you look at the, the way that they describe the work, um, they use a particular, you know, they, they use straight policy gradient, PPO, uh, um, proximal policy optimization, and it has become the default reinforcement learning because it's simple and has good performance, right? But people are, are writing deep network representations of, their, of, the, of the controller and doing basically vanilla policy search to get this. And, you know, it works very well. 
you know, should we expect it to work, right? So if you look at the architecture there, um, they they separate out the the perception system from the the feedback controller, which I'll point out later is a theme that that happens often. Uh, you know, it's a it, it's a mapping from observed uh, robot states and block states uh, through some network with a lot of recurrent units. These these LSTM is just a recurrent neural network. Okay, uh, it's got a 1024 uh, layer ReLU network and then 512 uh, recurrent networks. You know, so so is there something here? Are we? You know, we've we've been learning, I think, about what has made supervised learning work. Uh, and over parameterization seems like a very strong and, and uh, interpret, you know, an, uh, a story we can get our head around. And actually, I was, Miriam and I were just saying a minute ago that, uh, uh, you know, something thinking a little bit about linear networks taught us a lot about this interpolating solutions idea for deep networks. And I don't know, is the same thing going to be true for, for control? Like, can we understand some of the success of these deep? representations based on their parameter, their over parameterization? What does it mean to have, you know, more parameters than your control task? It's different than saying like the number of parameters compared to my images in my data set. So that's a good question. I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but, but it's super interesting. And, and, but what I do think is that maybe we don't need the over parameterization to be successful in these. So there's a few lessons from control, um, I think about ways that we maybe could be doing informed control parameterizations. And I'd like to, to push a little bit whether they, they explain some of the success. So one of them here is from Mario. So, uh, so in the LQR problem, right? The, one of our standard uh, tried and true success stories from control, where I have a quadratic objective, a state space defined by X, linear dynamics. Um, <clears throat> so if you were to go into MATLAB and, and solve the LQR problem, then uh, MATLAB would solve a Riccati equation. It would, it would go through an intermediate solution, which basically computes the cost to go function first. And then from the cost to go solution, which happens to be quadratic, you would extract the linear feedback gains. And uh, some, you know, sort of surprising, you know, we, we know that, for instance, if you were to, to measure this objective, in terms of the policy parameters k directly, then it's nonlinear in that um, in that parameterization. It's non-convex in that parameterization. So the question is, you know, if I were to just do policy search directly in k, does that work? And Mariam shows yes, you actually can do policy gradient um, on these LQR problems and and expect that to work. And that's awesome. I mean, you know, maybe that's the beginning of something like these linear networks and understanding how that could apply to the more complicated situations. Um, you know, people have built on this work. Uh, Mahalo's done a great um, uh, set of extensions, thinking about the, the way that that has implications for, um, you know, model-free le learning. So if you're really doing this based on sampling, putting some PL uh, inequalities on there to try to put some, some convergence rates. And uh, it's, it's a very, I think that's a, a strong story that we should continue. Um, it's maybe more general than that. So, so how does this not explain, for instance, the, um, the manipulation problem is this is still full state feedback, right? And I argued that, that we're too stuck on full state feedback. And so is there any story like this that can extend? <clears throat> um, well, the, the default uh, output feedback problem is if I were to have uh, a static output feedback, for instance, so I have my same linear dynamical system I now just have y is, is some um, potentially a subset or some, some combination of my x's, and I try to search for u equals negative ky. I think we know actually that it shouldn't, it will not work in that case, I would say. Um, we know that the, the, the static output feedback problem is, uh, is hard. It's uh, in particular the set of stabilizing k is a disconnected set. So that's my, that's the root of my statement that the policy gradient shouldn't work is that. You could be in a, a, a controller K that works fairly well, but the optimal solution, in order to get to the optimal solution, you might actually have to go to an unstable set of parameters K in order to get back. Okay, so, so there's a counter example, I guess. Um, I mean, if this, the one I put up here is, is a particularly simple one because uh, Y is a scalar, U is a scalar, so K is a scalar. And if you wanted to just verify it, you can, you can go through and look at the 
close loop eigenvalues for a handful of k's and see that it actually has to go unstable in order to get back. Okay, so the set of stabilizing k in this case is a disconnected set. Okay, so um, you know, policy search works in one case, policy search doesn't work in another case. Where does that put us? Okay. Um, <clears throat> Output feedback more generally, I mean, LQG, H infinity, uh, we do have some convex parameterizations, right? So um, there are cases where the set of stabilizing Ks is a connected set. Um, and there's different parameterizations that work. I mean, the, the, basic, um, the basic idea that you could have in your head is that what you need is not a static uh, output feedback controller, but you need a dynamic output feedback controller. In LQG, that output feedback controller would be the Kalman filter, for instance, and then the LQR controller. Um, if you're searching over the, um, the dynamic output feedback controllers, then the problem is, is, of course, at one limit, it's the static. If you increase the size of your estimator, the number of states in your estimator, something amazing happens when the, the number of states in your estimator matches the number of states in your plant, then the, the one really ugly constraint, the rank constraint disappears or becomes in, you know, effectively inactive and the problem has a, is convex again. Okay, so, so there are cases where if you have a dynamic output feedback controller, you would expect Mariam's results to sort of extend, I think. Um, uh, there are different ways to see that in, in uh, you know, different parameterizations. The, the EULA parameter is, is sort of one parameterization in the time domain, I think of EULA as being particularly effective for the for finite time problems, finite horizon problems. Um, there's also linear matrix inequality formulations, which like the famous H2 and H infinity cases where you, if you want the infinite horizon, you can write a convex um, uh, reparameterization of your problem. And it's interesting, um, you know, I think uh, the the idea that you can just search in K and find the optimal solution, um, you know, some people I think were kind of like, yeah, I understand, I, I kind of expected that, right? And and the um, I try I started to dig into like the you know the control theory. So I said, okay, if you, you you didn't look surprised by that. So so what is it that didn't surprise you about that? And, and they said, well, of course, if you have a convex parameterization of the controller, and there's a smooth mapping from that convex parameterization to your parameters of interest, then it can't introduce new local minima. So you know, if the level sets are connected roughly, then great. It doesn't mean that the problem is going to be convex, but at least gradient descent should work. And I think it should work in the EULA parameters. It should work in LMI. Um, you know, the, the existence even of these convex parameterizations suggests that um, that policy search should work even in the original parameterization. Um, but these are still for linear systems, right? So um, I think a big question is, how general those those observations are? Can we infer something about AlphaGo or uh, or or um, OpenAI cubes? I don't know. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a sense, I I don't want to just talk totally uh, uh, abstractly about the parameterizations. There's some very simple ideas I think that you can take home and use, and I think like we don't tend to use in RL, but we should. I think um, so. The Euler parameters are, are uh, you know, scary name, super easy to think about in the in the simple case. Okay, so I've got my original LQR problem. I've written it in discrete time just to keep the Euler's parameterization simpler. Um, so my same quadratic cost, um, my linear dynamical system. The way we normally parameterize um, a time varying, uh, you know, a finite horizon controller is we have u equals k n. Uh, I had to include a time in index on K just because it's a finite horizon problem, so it doesn't um, doesn't necessarily have a, a static K solution. And that's the way we normally parameterize it. And if you run this through, you can see the non-convexity occur because the K that you used at time zero changed the X you have at time one. If you're multiplying K times the X at time one, then you get a product of Ks. Okay, so that's that's the fundamental a reason that you get this non-convex uh, parameterization in terms of K. Simple change. Um, instead of saying K times XN, say K times X zero, okay? That sounds weird, but let me just uh, 
first convince you that it, it algebraically solves the problem, right? So if I were to just write my control decision only as a linear function of the initial conditions, then now the, it breaks the product um, and I get a sum of Ks. The Ks do not multiply on top of each other. I have K all being uncorrelated. They're all related to the, just the initial state. Now you think, okay, um, you know, that can't work if there's like disturbances or noise or something. So uh, that's true. And the way that you address that is you put in a disturbance-based feedback. So you have K uh, times X zero handles your sort of nominal case. And then any deviation from that nominal expected trajectory gives you a disturbance, but you write it relative to the expected nominal. And that can still be, if you're only adding in K times your disturbances, then that can still be uh, completely convex, okay? So there are lessons from control that I think we should be embracing in RL. And, uh, you know, they can work for output. That, that idea, I wrote it in the, only in the simplest form. It can still work for, um, for output feedback too. Uh, and the simplest way to see that, I guess, would be to say, I've got an input-output dynamical system here where um, my Y at, ne at the next time is some linear function of the history of Ys and the history of Us plus some error term. And the way you do this disturbance-based feedback in general is you have your nominal U times some big K matrix times the error, you know, the initial Y and then the errors at each time. Okay, so it, it perfectly uh, uh, works for disturbance-based feedback. And I think that's closer to a, a parameterization that we could be using in, in our, you know, let's say pixels to torques kind of control. There's a couple of nice examples of it. Sadra's done some, Max Simtwitz has got another one and bringing in some of these cool ideas from improper learning and from online optimization into the, into the world. So for instance, um, what does this tell you? This tells you that uh, for simple, uh, as a simple example, if I have a linear Gaussian system, uh, then I could just do gradient descent to recover the LQG controller up to a similarity transform. So th because there's nothing to that would, uh, if you haven't imposed a state representation, then you could have a similarity transform times your state representation. But basically I could just get LQG from gradient descent too. And I think the robust controllers and the like also. So that's super interesting. And I hope that work continues and I hope we can see um, if it actually tells us something about the, the really complex versions. Just because you can search over K directly though, doesn't mean you should. I think there's more questions to ask, like what Mihail has been thinking about is, you know, like these, these convergence rate questions. Um, you know, is it better to search? If I know a convex parameterization, should I search in the convex parameters or should I search in K directly? Um, I think the answer is more subtle. We've looked at this a bit. Um, the answer is more subtle than I thought. I would have thought that if you have a convex parameterization, you'd almost always win by, by searching in it. Um, but you can find examples, you know, simple low dimensional systems where it's better to search in K. You can find systems that it's better to search in uh, in the covariance matrix. There's, there's um, I think it's, it's a complicated story, but I hope that we will have a, a, a near future where we really understand that story well and have specific recommendations of what's the right way to parameterize your policy. As a simple example of, of something that you might think would be better, like the set of stabilizing K, even if it's connected is still non-trivial. So if, like, if you want to find your initial K, that could be uh, annoying if your system is very unstable, right? Um, <clears throat> so uh, you could imagine if you had a model, for instance, it'd be way more convenient to search over Q and R because if I just, uh, you know, set for any Q and R that are positive, now that's a trivial parameterization, any, any Q and R that are positive, I call a MATLAB, I get a stabilizing K back, right? So that, that's way easier to work with than just sort of searching randomly in K. Uh, and, and, but it's not obviously better. Uh, so there are cases where you can make that numerically bad and that actually searching for K directly is better. We did some work actually a long time ago about looking at the difference between searching in Q and R, looking in the EULA parameters, looking in K, um, you know, uh, in RL. It was a very early study, but I think there's, there's more work to do there. Uh, <clears throat> there's still a big gap, though, between, between these results and, and sort of the results of, for control and contact, right? So contact inherently means 
that we're, we're there's a, if there's a discontinuity, you know, it's, uh, it's not a continuous linear vector field. There's something more complicated going on. Um, but I also think we tend to make the problem harder for ourselves. So this is a place that Sam and I have talked a lot, you know, so, um, so, you know, Sam says it should be smooth, you know, that if I have, uh, you know, especially in the limit of like a massless foot, you can make everything beautiful and good. Um, I'm going to go with a different one here, which is that, you know, I think control has uh, a little bit focused on the worst case, right? And um, asking for a, an algorithm to, to, you know, a policy search or whatever it is to work for, you know, all A, B, and C of some particular size is like a really hard problem to solve, right? And if, if, you, if you say, here's a particular A, B, and C, I like policy to search to work for that, that's maybe a much easier. Maybe the world never gives us the ones that have like holes and zeros interleaved in, in sort of terrible ways. And, uh, you know, actually the real world is pretty, pretty simple. So, so I think there might be something about the way we uh, describe the family of, of problems that we're trying to study. Uh, and control, I think, has been conservative in that regard. And RL is just building a simulator and doing some domain randomization. And that's my set of systems that I care about. And I'll search that. And there's something really good about that, I think. Um, I also think there's something really good about um, uh, trying to do multiple tasks with a single controller. I think even um, lessons from trajectory optimization, it was very acute for me in trajectory optimization. You could have a trajectory optimization problem where um, you write down your cost function, it looks reasonable, you've got a particular dynamical system. The solution that you get out is this like quirky thing that you didn't really want, okay? If you just ask that same trajectory to be robust over a lot of different um, parameters, then those quirky strange solutions tend to disappear. And you end up, um, I think, having a better cost landscape, you know, not necessarily convex, but at least nicer. Okay, and I think some of that must be happening in the RL world too, that somehow by just asking for the same controller to work over many tasks, I think the landscape is different and probably friendlier. Um, but I don't know exactly. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's, it's very hard. I, it's, I think the fact that domain, uh, domain randomization is like great and, and cool, um, but the way we do domain randomization right now of like putting leopard prints on things or like, you know, it's a, it might be a Coke can, it might be a giraffe or whatever. Like if uh, there is another lesson from control, I think, which is that from robust control, which is that if the problem is very easy, then you can be very sloppy with your uncertainty distributions, right? You can say like, try to stabilize every possible, you know, system, but I've got so much control authority, that's fine. And if we want to get to harder control tasks, tying my shoelaces or, or something like this, I think we're going to have to be a little bit more narrow with our uncertainty specification in order to, to be able to find any controller that works. So um, I think we'll have to do, I, I think we're probably, as we evolve into more complicated tasks, have to do a little bit more careful domain randomization. Okay, there's also lessons from um, the, the people I call the robot whisperers, right? The ones that like um, can always make robots work and do amazing things and they don't use RL and they don't, um, you know, it's, uh, they just somehow can, can make a robot do almost anything uh, if you give them a specific task, right? Uh, Raybert is actually one of them, right? Uh, and I mean this in the best possible way, right? So, so um, if you look at the control that was written by Raybert, for the, um, you know, for the hopper and then the whole series of robots that followed uh, that turned into Boston Dynamics and, and everything, right? The control description fit on a single page of his book, right? And it was basically this picture, right? It was not a EULA parameter. It was not, a, you know, uh, anything. It was a state machine where in each, in each state, it was um, a, a linear a PID controller, PD controller most of the time. Um, but it had this sort of transition mechanics that dealt with the contact, right? Uh, so, so when when I touch down, I switch into a slightly different controller that's now thinking about my uh, my body angle instead of my leg angle. And uh, you know, his intuition guided him into an incredibly simple uh, control parameterization, which then could actually be tuned directly on the robot. Like his the observation for hopping height was that. If you turn the knob up on how much air you inject into the cylinder on every step, then it hops higher, 
well, that's cool. So like, why don't we hop it in place and like turn it up until it's hopping about the right height and okay, good, move on, you know? And, and there's something amazing about that, that we're missing. Like I, I, I've always thought of this as a, as a um, limitation. I mean, all the optimization-based control we know how to do, we can never spit out something as simple as, as beautiful as this. Um, it happens, you know, the, the, this is a, just a newer version of that in some sense, right? This is, um, that's Andy Berry, uh, you know, whacking on the spot robot or whatever, and it can open doors and it's incredibly robust and it's incredibly good. And it's, I don't know the details of it, but it's executing something pretty similar, I think, to these um, guarded state machines where it, it, you know, reach out and touch until, you know, if I'm too far away, it'll do something slightly different. And you can put those, you can wire up those kind of simple state machines over and over. When I talk to people who write controllers that do really impressive things through contact, they tend to have this very simple sort of state machine type architecture to them. And it really um, frustrates me that we don't know how to search over them in any rigorous way. I think the, the good controllers are probably fairly simple if we get it right. Okay, we have to think about deep parameterizations. Um, and in particular, we have to think about perception and, and computer vision. So um, this is a series of experiments we did fairly recently, which was, uh, was exploring deep representations for feedback control. And honestly, it's the most happy I've ever been in terms of how, what, what, a, what does a good feedback controller actually look like executing on a manipulation sort of task on a real robot. So, um, we didn't solve the big RL problem on this. We were trying to study the representation question. So we cheated that and just tried to do imitation learning. Like I couldn't even tell you the, the cost function that we would want to use for a lot of these tasks. Um, but, but if the cost function is just copy what Pete does with his teleop interface, or if I have a simple controller that exists that I can, I just want to clone into my deep uh, representation, then that's a very well-defined problem. And it's a nice one, sort of an acute one for, for studying the representational questions separate from the synthesis question. Okay. Um, and one of the things we learned as we, as we started looking more carefully at this is that a lot of the deep network, um, you know, pixels to torque kind of controllers, uh, they actually do separate out pretty explicitly the perception part of the network and the control part of the network. So we tend to have like a massive network here that's, that's taking the image in, putting out a relatively small uh, low dimensional representation that we put into a relatively much smaller policy here. This would be like the joints of the robot that come in uh, at the last sort of part and maybe and some latent representation Z. Um, but the actual control policies, like the LSTM for the OpenAI, was relatively small compared to the perception policy. Um, they, these tend to be smaller, okay? Uh, and why do we do that? Well, we need we tend to to start with something that was trained on ImageNet, or we want to be able to train the perception network as a perception network by itself, and then push that into our perception. Because if we wanted to do end-to-end -end training all the way through something that was capable of dealing with images that's a little daunting. So, and you, it's not clear we'd have the diversity or robustness to get the perceptual features we like that we get from ImageNet. Okay, so um, the control that we put together for this was um, a small LSTM network. So again, a dynamic network. And now you can understand um, why I think there's something happening here that, that I think does connect, right? So. Um, it, we see a big difference in the ability to train networks that have recurrent elements in them. So that is now a dynamic output feedback controller, just like the static output feedback controller being bad in the linear case, but the dynamic output feedback controller being good again, when the number of state elements hit the number of plan elements, maybe there's something similar going on here that people are having more success with a recurrent network uh, the problem might get easier, not convex, I doubt, but, uh, but uh, somehow better when, when you have a dynamic network uh, in the loop. Okay, but this was a simple um, case of mapping a simulated controller, a, a handwritten controller uh, for a couple tasks in. We just banged on this in simulation, made sure we could clone policies and, and understand the representation there. And then um, <clears throat> we chose a different representation. There's a handful of people, of ways people have chosen Z. Some people do 
autoencoders. Some people try to train it all end to end. There's a various different representations. We've been pushing a lot on this idea of, of using key points as a, a sort of a summary of the geometry, but a very low dimensional summary of the geometry that can work for a variety of different objects. And there's a couple of days, different ways. I'll show you that we make the key points, okay? But we, again, have a big perception network that's trained to go through and output a, a handful of, of key points, which are, um, you know, can be defined even for deformable objects, okay? And then put it into a relatively smaller network with these LSTMs. And, um, <clears throat> you know, this is not a very dynamic task in this example, but it's cool that that key point representation allows us to handle a whole diversity of objects. So you can have a label key points that would be, for instance, I want the, the center of the handle of the mug to be on this peg. That's a pretty good task representation. And we could suddenly start manipulating a whole variety of, of mugs in order to get them into onto the peg. Okay, so it's a useful representation bottleneck for us. Um, it also connects very well to the success people have had in, in deep learning. It started with uh, human post tracking. People would start doing key points, but lots of people use key points very successfully in, uh, in, in computer vision these days. You know, the one example I just showed, we just labeled a handful of key points. That was actually um, human supervised labels on just a small data set. And then we could say, okay, the task is to just put that key point on the, on the rack, basically. But the other thing we've done is try to do uh, self-supervised key points. And that runs through this technology of dense correspondences, which, um, so Lucas is now at NVIDIA with, uh, with Dieter. You might, I think he's a neighbor of yours, if not a colleague. Um, he's great, you should definitely talk to him. And actually the, um, the work built on, off Tanner Schmidt and, and Richard and, uh, and Dieter's work on, on dense correspondences, okay? But um, <clears throat> the, the core idea behind learning self-supervised features um, for more complicated objects was to learn these dense descriptors. So what you're seeing here is an image that's, that's almost frozen. There's a mouse that's just putting, um, we're putting our mouse over some point in the hat. And what we're showing you here is our best guess at where that same point is, the corresponding point. Okay, this is the, the perceptual correspondence problem. We're trying to find a point here and where's the point on this hat in this different image that corresponds. Let me actually just play that again so that you see. Okay, so this is now the bill of the hat and it's tracking in the middle. This is the output of the dense descriptor network, which has got a heat map saying where it thinks the correspondence is. We take the peak of that heat map and we draw it over here, okay? And the fact that these are very different images, but we're tracking uh, you know, pretty reliably the correspondence is what makes this sort of work for us. And it's, it's incredibly uh, impressive and it's the magic of, of, of deep learning and it's the magic of self-supervision that we can train this um, by this simple pipeline. So basically the robot uh, just starts waving itself around or we can do this in a multi-camera setup also, but but we basically have the, the robot wave a camera around a static object. We do a dense 3D reconstruction of that object. And then we can go back and in all the different images that we took, say that this point on the dense reconstruction should have been the same, this pixel and this pixel, since they touch the same point on the dense reconstruction, they should be labeled the same. And points that didn't hit the same point on the construction should be labeled as different. And you can make a pixel-wise contrast of loss was our first version. We've done key point style heat losses too, um, you know, cost functions too, and it just works incredibly well. And you can very quickly generate a lot of data and uh, it's been a great representation for us. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> I'll skip that. So, so this really got to a super exciting for me, uh, you know, form of feedback control for an, some non-trivial tasks in, in, in manipulation too. So, this doesn't look that much different maybe than the mugs on the rack, but it's now more dynamic, right? If I wanted to write the dynamics of a shoe flipping up on the corner, um, right? This is, this is not just like enveloping grasp, the robot dynamics is all that matters. This is actually sort of the dynamics of the shoe matters. And it's working over a whole category of different shoes. This one was actually, uh, you know, we hadn't trained on this at all. And it was, it was a sort of a surprise that it worked. Um, if, if I had the audio on, you'd hear people go, Huzzah! you know, kind of, um, it works for a handful of different tasks. 
but it's very narrow in the sense that you, you have to imitation, you have to do lots of imitations for each one of these things to work. But inside your imitations, it seems to work incredibly well. So um, this is you know, picking up a plate. Because we've pre-trained the perception network, it's very robust to perceptual uncertainty. And uh, it's very, it's actually pretty robust to the dynamic uncertainty too. Okay. One of the biggest differences though, it's almost not fair to compare. I think one of the biggest differences that the reason that this works so well compared to some of the other approaches we've tried is that uh, it's using real-time RGB feedback where a lot of our approaches in, in manipulation control, you know, we just don't know how to consume camera information at frame rate and how to change our control decisions. So as opposed to like a perceive the environment, estimate the state, make a plan, execute. This is constantly ev evaluating the, the state of the environment through the cameras. And that I think is the fundamental reason why it's it's very robust. That was a you know an example of something very deformable, but it's still, I mean, moderately deformable and it's still um, accomplishing the task. Okay, so um, deep perception, unquestionably good. Uh, I said we we're actually using a relatively small set of neural network for um, for the control part, and we've got all these lessons from control theory. You know, is it, are we really getting anything magical from that last little thing being a neural network? You know, relus or whatever. I, I would like to question that, right? So, so could we take the deep network head and push it through uh, maybe a, a control parameterization that we like or know from control? And the stories here is still evolving, but um, in the context of this dish loading um, uh, project that I've been working on at TRI, which has been Super fun and, and uh, amazingly good. We've got robots that can sort of do the dishes all day long. And it's not about trying to make a commercial dish loader. It's just about taking any project with manipulation of this complexity and trying to understand how do you actually take machine learning and perception and get 99.9% .9 reliability. And it's extremely interesting and extremely hard. Um, so this one just runs sort of all day long. You know, it'll put the dishes in the dishwasher, it'll throw the non-dishes over here. Um, it fails sometimes. We try to catch the failures, analyze them, close the sim to real gap, close the perception gap, try to study lifelong learning. We're doing all these kind of things. Okay, it's, it's, um, it's been a very good exercise for us. There's lots of interesting control that happens, right? So whether from opening the door, pulling out the racks, um, grabbing bugs in dense clutter, having to nudge things out. It's a big hand and a to get into the sink, sometimes it has to actually sort of nudge things out of the corner. Um, so there are some dynamics and control problems, but my favorite by far is this plate pickup, which is kind of is why we did the other plates in the other example. Um, there's a very, so Sivan here is a robot whisperer un unquestionably. And, uh, and he originally wrote a controller that had a sort of state machine smell to it. It would go to a pre-grasp pose. It would do some visual servoing to a line. It would reach until it touched. It would slide under the plate until it touched. And um, it's incredibly robust. Uh, well, I mean, he would complain. I think that we can, we can definitely break it, but it's, it's well, it's, it works well enough that the dish, the, the sink basically always gets cleared. Um, and now we're trying to hammer on that and see if we could have gotten the same thing out of, a, uh, out of an automatic synthesis. And so Andres has been thinking about this. We have toy models with planar uh, plates in the sink and the like. And uh, we're just hammering on this and trying to exp explore the problems of different control parameterizations for, for the same sort of task. Um, again, we can, I think we've, we've found the place where we're pretty happy for a task like this, where the geometry tells us a lot of the story. Uh, key points seem to be a good you know, middle ground between what perception can give us and what we want to consume from control. So we, we identify a bunch of key points and then we just, um, you know, we're actually doing just black box optimization on this uh, CMAES style optimization and finding, but we're doing it on control parameterizations that look more like these EULA parameters and simple um, control parameterizations. And uh, I will, I hope to report the full answer later, but they seem to work uh, very well still. So I think, um, I, I think it doesn't, I, my current belief is that it doesn't require a ReLU network to be magically good. There are other lessons from robotics that I want people to embrace. I know I'm um, getting towards the end of the time here. So, um, you know, force and impedance control is an amazingly good thing, right? So this is an example from the class I'm teaching right now. So we, um, I was talking about bin picking and we had a, 
um, I just had them drop YCB objects, uh, you know, thank you, Sid, and all, you know, YCB objects from the sky into a, into a cluttered bin and then talked about the standard approaches to grasp synthesis and grasp optimization and we try to visualize everything. And then we, we trained a mask RCNN network to try to uh, do instance segmentation. I just sort of use this for, to push on all the different aspects of Manipulation, and it was funny that I made a you know ten thousand image data set for them to, to play with, and um, and image number you know, like nine 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 five four or something. I just happened to look at it, and I was like, huh, there's no way that our robot hand can pick up this cheese it box. It's just like staring at me right in the face. Like there's just nothing I could do with a enveloping grasp that's going to grab that cheese it box off the off the bottom of the of the bin. So how do we do something better? And I use that as an example to talk about force control. And maybe I can even give you a super short uh, example of the type, type of way I've been trying to, to teach remotely here. But um, uh, normally, if, if we had more time, I would actually make you run this yourself. But um, here's a cheese it box. Uh, I cut the side off the box off so you can see better. But um, I, can, uh, I can show you, I've replaced the the hand with a point finger just to make the math a little simpler. But I've written a controller that reasons explicitly about forces. So, um, so there's a some friction cone that we estimate. We can be very approximate. We talked about how approximate it could be. Um, and I'd like to somehow make sure that the corner of the box uh, over here stays inside the friction cone. And I've written a little controller that say you're allowed to move the finger around, but it's only under the constraint that you never produce a force on the box that exceeds that friction cone. And, um, and so, we, we have a controller now that can sort of do amazingly cool things with the box that I think you would be very hard to do with a position control to interface, right? So, um, so I can just write like a two line controller that um, for instance, just pushes the box and then uh, applies a force just with a PID control in the orientation of the box reasons about the contact forces never exceeds the friction cone. And I could have rotated that box up, but it required something a little bit more than just uh, you know a little less naivety about the contacts. Um, but there are other things that we know that are beautiful and good from, from control too. Impedance control is another one, you know, stiffness control. So this particular controller requires some knowledge about the friction cone, but there are other ways to parameterize it that require very very little. So here's an example of um, of writing the same controller. Now I've made the box uh, transparent. I've made a virtual stiffness controller that goes here, and uh, I should I should have done that in two parts. I was trying to rush, but basically, if I were to tip up the box at the end, and I want wanted to think about the position or the way that the finger had to to work, if the box was rotating up. And I had to watch for the moment that that force slipped and suddenly pushed down right at the end. That would be like super hard to write. But if you write an impedance controller, you can just say, eh, make yourself act like you got a rubber band pulling you towards this point in the world. And um, you can do that without any knowledge of the box. And it can do really complicated tasks really easily. Okay. So something like that uh, has to be part of the story, too, I think. And in fact, you can take those key points, and if you just um, you know estimate the key points of the object, and uh, and now think about the forces that you're applying at the end of the object, and do something like impedance control at the endpoint of some unknown object that you've picked up, it works sort of shockingly well. So there's no um, there's deep learning for the key points, but a very simple controller now that can do all these peg and hole insertions, that can do a bunch of different um, pretty complicated contact tasks over a category level of different objects, just using force control, basically impedance control. Okay, um, so in previous times I've talked to, to this group, I've talked a lot about sums of squares optimization, I've talked about mixed integer convex optimization, and actually we're still working on that. And I, we have some new results coming out from both of those that I'm actually super excited about. I see that as the evolution of where I hope we can do things better than stochastic rating descent in the long run. Um, and I think it leads to more understanding. But I do think there's, I wanted to sort of give something different this time because I really think the right formulation for control through contact has to reason about the limitations of perception. 
um, and the sort of rich distributions over tasks. So for instance, the reason that Siwan or wrote the dish pickup or Mark wrote his incredible balance uh, hopping controller, um, it was, he had, they both had some very um, rich understanding of the diversity of different thing, situations that controller was gonna find itself in. Looking at the instantaneous state uh, and thinking about an instantaneous trajectory, some in some deterministic way of the of the of the task is not going to solve is not going to achieve the same levels of robustness. So we need something more. Um, and I'll I'll skip the last part, but I'll tell you quickly about model predictive control. So you might ask, so why explicitly represent the um, the the policy? Why not do a model predictive control? And we've been playing with that too. So in the key points world. Um, the, the last thing that Lucas and, uh, did for his thesis was, was to see if we could take those key points and just learn a forward model of the key points. So you just learn the key point dynamics as a function, you know, it basically has to learn the geometry and the contact mechanics of the hand pushing, but the thing we're using as our state representation for our forward model is the location of some key points, and we're representing that in a deep network, okay? And then can you take that and do model predictive control on it? There's a very weird thing about model predictive control on deep networks is that people tend to just do gradient or genetic algorithms on it, right? So Byron, you know, the MPPI uh, work that, that Byron did is, was the best, we um, uh, that worked the best for us and we, we used it uh, here. Uh, I still think we, should, we shouldn't be doing uh, such random search on, on these representations when we're all done. Okay, so this worked pretty well and it could solve for um, much more uh, general class of tasks where you had to, you did imitations, you did a bunch of uh, sort of teleop demonstrations to learn a model, but then if you had a slightly different task, you could you could avoid do, redoing the imitations for all those different tasks. Okay, um, I do think you can train and predict dynamics even for contact problems in a deep network. I don't. I would not deny that you can do. Um, you know, basically represent the key, the contact dynamics in a deep network, but I think planning and control is still hard. So I'll finish there and and jump to some uh, some summary here at the end. At the end, okay. I think control through contact is very much an evolving storyline. Um, for me, manipulation has forced some of the big questions on control through contact. I think these limitations of perception and the diverse contact geometry mechanics over a range of objects. I think that's the good stuff, right? Um, and I think we need very approximate models that we can reason about uh, quickly and uh, approximately uh, instead of very accurate ones like the networks are giving us very accurate ones, but they're so, too complicated to be able to reason about. Uh, so there's maybe a battle ground of, of the deep networks versus the Rayburn controllers. Uh, we'll, I would love for those two worlds to come together. I'll stop there and ask, I'll take any questions. Sorry, I went a little long.